Paul Glazier, you've become something of a global authority on the, the problem of too much medicine. How big do you think that problem is? Well, Ray, we don't have an exact estimate. People guess somewhere between 20 and 40 percent um, of all care is low value or unnecessary care or overdiagnosis, a range of terms that we can come back to. So the middle guess is sort of 30 percent. For cancer, we are now getting pretty exact figures. So recently we had estimated that for prostate cancer in Australia, 40% of all men who have a so-called prostate cancer detected are overdiagnosed. That is, those cancers never would have disturbed a person in their lifetime. They never would have become symptomatic. They wouldn't have been detected 20 or 30 years ago. That's how we worked it out. And we're now looking across the board for all cancers, and that's roughly 20%. And that's just the overdiagnosis component. And we have pockets for lots of other conditions. We're discovering it in most other areas, and we um, find the same sort of patchwork of, of some very large areas of overdiagnosis and overtreatment and some others where it's just fine. So I think that 30% figure is probably going to pan out, but we don't know perfectly yet. That's an extraordinary figure, potentially a third of healthcare being unnecessary is what you're suggesting. Yes, and it's been a growth over the years as we've got better technology, broadened our definitions, etc. So it's not like that it's happened overnight. It's been a long time coming. Before we get into some of the fine details, I mean, why exactly is this a problem? I mean, what, what, what is there, why is there reason to be concerned? Well, I see two problems, Ray. The first problem is the people who are being overtreated or overdiagnosed men with prostate cancer, for example, that never would have disturbed them in their lifetime, still end up with the treatment. They can get surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, they can get monitored for life, they get complications like impotence or incontinence, and it disturbs their, their whole, turns their life upside down, unnecessarily because they never would have need to, needed to have had treatment in their lifetime. And for all of the things that we're going to talk about in too much medicine, I think there are harms to patients. That's my first concern. But the second is it overloads the system as well. This is a cost to the system. And as Margaret McCartney, a GP in Glasgow, once said, we're so busy worrying the well we don't have time to take care of the sick. It's a concern because it's putting a stress on our system and is actually meaning lesser care for the people who really need it. A lot of the evidence about overtreatment and overdiagnosis comes from other parts of the world. Um, and I know that, that, as you mentioned, we're still getting a sense of how big the problem is. But do we know if this is a big problem in Australia? Uh, yes, Ray. Some of our estimates come from overseas, but the cancer figures that I mentioned earlier are all Australian figures. And we've been looking at this for a variety of, Austra uh, of Australian conditions in mental health, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, etc. And our figures are comparable um, with the US or Europe, for example. So we think that for most things, it's probably a similar sort of rate. So that range that I said of the 20 to 40% probably applies to Australia as well, as far as we can tell. So too much medicine is, is just one of the factors that is driving the growth in healthcare costs. Yes. Can you talk briefly about what, what those major factors are? Well, we think that the overtreatment, overdiagnosis area is probably the largest of all of them. And there are figures we've been looking at from the US, um, which also may apply in some way to Australia. For example, administrative costs. Actually, we've got very low administrative costs in Australia. Pricing, well, there are a few um, things that are overpriced in Australia. That's true. Fraud rates are actually pretty low in Australia generally good to get rid of it because it's unnecessary, but actually compared with the overdiagnosis and overtreatment, it's pretty small. Um, and there are a few other areas like that, but we think that the biggest driver is actually this area of overdiagnosis and overtreatment, the unnecessary care per person. Aging is a smaller component of this. Most people think it's the aging population is causing um, most of the driving uh, drivers of costs. Actually, there's a Grattan report that suggests it's the treatment per condition or per person that's driving it, and the ageing is only a minor component of the whole problem. When we talk about too much medicine, we're really talking about a group of, of interrelated problems. Uh, people will have heard terms like overtreatment, low-value care, overdiagnosis. Um, 
without getting into too much detail, can you give us uh, just a brief description of these different problems? So first of all, what is overtreatment? So Ray, overtreatment is when somebody has a real condition, but they get too much treatment or unnecessary treatment for it. To give you an example, we know that antibiotics get overused. We recently did a study of respiratory tract infections, colds, bronchitis, etc., in Australia. Um, and we found that about two thirds of the antibiotics prescribed were unnecessary when we looked through the doctor's notes for that. So that was over treatment that actually is wasting our antibiotics and causing um, uh, increasing antibiotic resistance. And we know we can get that down. If you look at Sweden, for example, they've had the same rates as us of uh, prescribing 20 years ago. They're now one third of our rates. So we could come down to those Swedish levels. That's an example of overtreatment. What about low value care? What is it and what's an example? Low value care is something where patients might get um, a minimal, um, if any, benefit out of it. An example of that might be osteoarthritis of the knees. A common thing that has been done is to put an arthroscope in to look inside the knee and then wash it out and do a bit of cleaning up, so-called lavage and debridement. We now have a couple of sham uh, trials that have compared real arthroscopy with a sham process and found um, minimal effect. There's this tiny effect in the first few weeks afterwards, but longer term, there's absolutely no benefit. So that would be what I would call low value care. It's really not doing much for the patient at all and actually providing some risk to them too in doing the procedure. And, and what is overdiagnosis and what's an example there? So overdiagnosis is the most difficult to understand. We talked about one earlier, which is prostate cancer screening, where there's a pool of um, things that look like prostate cancer as men get older. Men my age, about half of us would actually have what looks like prostate cancer. And so if we go in and do tests and biopsies and things, we find a lot of unnecessary and overdiagnosed cancers. But it happens in non-cancer as well, lots of conditions. But to give you one example of a growing problem, there's a thing called spongy heart, or the technical term is left ventricular decompaction cardiomyopathy. Quite a mouthful, that one. It's a genetic condition and it's reasonably rare, maybe one in a hundred people or less have this. The old technology was to do a so-called echocardiogram. But if you use an MRI instead, we go up to rates of 20% of the population. And it's looking likely that the extra patients that would be being detected by this actually have nothing that would ever dis cause them a problem in their lifetime. No functional disturbance, no shortening of life expectancy, nothing. <laughs> and so that is the, an example of technology potentially ch um, changing who we diagnose. We're keeping the label, but we're actually stretching the numbers of people by 20 fold. So what's driving too much medicine? Why are so many people being overtreated, getting low value care, being overdiagnosed? What's driving it? There's no one dri magic driver here. Um, there's probably, you've documented maybe a dozen or more of the drivers, Ray. Um, but I'll probably see the major ones as being an overuse and improvement in our technology. Some of our tests are in a way just too good, as I was giving with the example of the spongy heart. The other big driver is our definitions keep changing. We think of diabetes or hypertension as being this thing that's set in stone. It's not. The definitions have gradually expanded over the years so that now many, many more people in the population are being diagnosed with those conditions. And we're getting to the boundary where we think a lot of people are getting minimal benefit and are being harmed by the label. So tell me a bit more about this. How do those definitions get expanded and why on earth would they be expanded too widely and, and catch people who don't need to be caught? So who does the changes in the definitions? It turns out to be mostly guideline committees who in the process of setting out the treatment guidelines often like to define um, what the condition is. And they will generally expand those if they change the definition of, at all. And when they're doing that, they often don't consider what the absolute benefits are and the evidence for the benefits in the lower risk patients that are being expanded to, nor, and we've studied this, do they ever consider the harms, the downsides of the expanded definition?
So can you give us an example of this, uh, of this problem of expanding definitions of disease or conditions, perhaps the, the changing uh, definitions of, of high blood pressure, whatever you like. Can you give us an example there? So um, the American College of Cardiology um, about two years ago came out with a new definition of what high blood pressure was. And they dropped the level. Um, in a way that would have ex expanded the, um, the number of people being defined as having hypertension in America to over 30 million more. In Australia, it would have been over 2 million people more. That was accepted by the major bodies in America, but rejected by their family physician group. And it's been rejected in Australia, and many of the European groups have explicitly rejected the American definition as being an over-definition or over-diagnosis problem that it's failed to consider the, the evidence for benefit versus the evidence for harm. Because the concern there is that some of the, the newly labelled may experience more harm than good from being labelled. Yes, that's exactly right, Ray. So there's, it's debatable whether there's a net benefit. There may be for a very small percentage of those, um, but for most people within that category, there would have been no met, net benefit. We would be far better off finding the people who actually have serious hypertension, high blood pressure, and making sure all of those are detected and treated rather than chasing the very low risk people and trying to redefine it to make almost everybody um, have hypertension. As you've become more aware of this problem, you've also tried to work on a number of fronts to address this problem of too much medicine and overdiagnosis. You helped set up the Preventing Overdiagnosis International Scientific Conference that's coming to Sydney this December. Um, but you're active on, on a number of fronts. What are we actually doing to try and stop or, or prevent this problem? We already know enough to do a number of things. Um, th th I would say there are three. One is that we need to try and reduce inappropriate testing. For example, screening tests. Some screening tests are good, but there's a lot of screening tests that do more harm than good. And we need to confine the types of screening tests and the people we target with those screening tests correctly, or we can do more harm than good. Second thing is the definitions that we've just been talking about. That's been a major problem of these expanding definitions. And for that, we really need to reform the process. We need to get panels of people who include generalists, consumers, et cetera, the people who will be influenced and affected by um, the, the changing definitions of diseases, not just the specialty group. We need the specialists there, but they need to be balanced and they need to have minimal or no conflicts of interest. And the second is that they need to consider a balance of the evidence, as in our checklist, that includes the evidence for benefit and the harms and downsides and how they balance out. The third thing is when people are diagnosed with a condition, they need to be um, better informed about the options available for treatment. You should be given the, what happens if there's no treatment at all or um, low risk treatments such as non-drug interventions or drugs or surgery, given that range of options as part of a shared decision making process. And part of it is the clinicians often not knowing what the range of options is. So we need to give better information to the clinicians as well as the patients. So you've talked about, I suppose, a few ways in which the system can change to try and start addressing this problem of too much medicine. Um, what about people themselves? What about all of us? How can we protect ourselves or our loved ones yeah. more from being overtreated or overdiagnosed? Well, I think the first is the awareness raising that we were talking about of being just a little skeptical um, and a little wary about um, disease labels. Is this a permanent label? What does this actually mean um, in, in, in its consequences to you? But also to ask about what are the options um, in managing this, this um, disease or having this test um, and then asking about the consequences of that, the benefits and the harms, before you decide on what to do about it. Paul Glasgow, thank you very much. A pleasure, Ray.